Ladies and gentlemen, we need to continue the session because we're quickly running out of time. So can I invite everybody to take their seats or leave the hall so that we can get started, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to continue now. May I kindly ask you to take your seats now. Thank you. Oh, th okay. I think that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, welcome back, everybody. We're, we're quickly approaching the end of the conference. We have two concluding speakers. The first one is someone who has uh, spoken here, I think, four times before. I think this is your fifth, uh, fifth time of uh, presenting the Iranian position here at Munich. It is my pleasure to welcome the Foreign Minister of Iran and to invite him to speak to us and then take a few questions if we have time. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Very good to you all, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be able to finally make it to this year's final day of the Munich Security Conference, having just arrived from a historic state visit of President Rouhani to India. Last year, I repeated before this forum Iran's proposal for a security arrangement in the Persian Gulf founded on dialogue, common principles, and confidence-building measures. Some of our neighbors, if you remember, used their opportunity here last year to level accusations against Iran. Some have, and others will, later this morning or this afternoon. You were the audience for a cartoonish circus just this morning, which does not even deserve a dignity of a response. So let's move to more serious subjects. I'm happy that in contrast to the approach of some, the UN Secretary General, speaking before this conference earlier, chose to endorse the forward-looking approach that I had underlined and outlined here last year. I am here today to expand on that approach and to tell you that unless there is a collective effort to bring inclusive peace and security to the Persian Gulf region, we will be engulfed in turmoil and potentially far worse. And not for this generation, but for generations to come. And our turmoil in this interconnected world is going to be everyone's turmoil, as evidenced by events in both our region and the world since the turn of the century. Today, the territorial defeat of Daesh, or as it's called here, ISIS, has heralded the return of some sense of stability to the vast territory it once occupied. But the defeat of one of the world's most evil organizations does not mean that the threat of extremism has been removed from the region or beyond. The root cause, the root causes, particularly the ideology of exclusion and hatred, continue to persist and may erupt elsewhere 
anytime. For too long, military powers have had multiple strategies to win war. For too long, they have ignored any strategy to win the peace. And for too long, major powers and the regional clients have made the wrong choices, particularly in our region, and then have blamed others, particularly Iran, for the consequences of their own wrong choices. Choices that have been short-sighted and trigger-happy and have ended in strategic blunders. Let me just tell you what these choices were. From supporting Saddam Hussein when he invaded my country in 1980, to aiding and abetting his use of chemical weapons against Iranian and Iraqi civilians and soldiers. From the wars to evict him from Kuwait, to the wars to remove him altogether. From first supporting Al-Qaeda against Soviet Union and Taliban against us, to then waging a war to remove them from Afghanistan. From supporting the same brand of terrorists and extremists in Syria, in the form of Daesh and al Nusra, bringing Syria to ruins, to dangerously occupying today parts of Syria under the guise of fighting the organizations that they financed, armed, and supported. From Israel's invasion and subsequent aggressions on Lebanon, its illegal occupation of Palestine, and its almost daily illegal incursions into Syrian airspace to attempt to create these cartoonish images to blame others for its own strategic blunders or maybe to evade the domestic crisis they're facing. And from bombing Yemen with Western supplied arms. What have these acts brought to the world? The US and its local clients in our region are suffering from the consequences of their own wrong choices. But they use this and other fora to revive the hysteria on Iran's foreign policy and try to obscure its realities. But did Iran force them to make these wrong choices? As some of them so ridiculously claim these days, that they supported extremism in order to face Iran? Are we to blame? Are we to blame because we refused to support Saddam Hussein? Because we fought Saddam Hussein? Because we were on the right side of history, fighting Saddam Hussein, fighting the Taliban, fighting Al Qaeda, fighting Daesh, fighting Nusra? consistently, instead of joining those who supported them in creation, in financing, and in arming. Distinguished friends, as I said before this forum last year, Iran believes that our security in the Persian Gulf requires a fresh regional security architecture. We believe in and have proposed creating what we call a strong region rather than a strong man in the region. And you've got to notice the difference. We want a strong region. We do not want to be 
the hegemon in the region as we believe the era of hegemony is long past, regionally as well as globally. A strong region where small and large nations, even those with historical rivalries, can contribute to stability. This is simply recognizing the need to respect the interests of all stakeholders in this Persian Gulf region, which is by its very nature a requirement for stability, while hegemonic tendencies by any regional or global power will, again, by its very nature, lead to insecurity. The arms race in our region, and no country probably represented here, can claim to be completely innocent of perpetuating that arms race, is an example of the destructive and unnecessary rivalry that has made our neighborhood unsafe and insecure for its own inhabitants as well as for any guests. In a quest to create a strong region, we need to be realistic and accept our differences. We need to move from the defunct concept of collective security and alliance formations to inclusive concepts, such as security networking in the area of networking globally, which can address issues that range from divergence of interest to disparities in size and power, as is the case in any virtual network you join. Security networking is a non-zero-sum approach that accepts that security is indivisible, as opposed to alliances and blocks, which are fundamentally based on the defunct zero-sum approach of gaining security at the expense of insecurity of others. The nuclear deal, and I see some people who were closely involved, Lady Ashton, Secretary Kerry, others here, was an example of such non-zero-sum thinking. Recognizing differences, but also recognizing that we could define common objectives. And maintaining respect for the interests and concerns of all participants led to the very difficult but successful outcome of the negotiations leading to the JCPOA. And that may be why those who see everything in terms of one-sided profiteering are intrinsically opposed to this deal without even reading it. Immediately after the conclusion of the JCPOA, Iran sought to use the same approach for the Persian Gulf and proposed to create a regional dialogue forum. The proposal fell on deaf ears. But that proposal is still on the table. You know why? Because that's the only game in town. That's the only viable alternative out of the misery that we have been in for the past many decades. It could become, if our neighbors join us, a forum that will be used as an instrument for helping organize and advance dialogue at the formal and informal levels in our region, and while encouraging intergovernmental and formal dialogue, it can also promote dialogue between scholars and thinkers and the general public. The parameters of Iran's proposed regional architecture are simple but effective. Rather than trying to ignore conflicts of interest, it will accept differences. Being premised on inclusivity, 
it can act as a firewall to prevent the emergence of an oligarchy among big states. And importantly, it allows smaller states to participate and have their interests protected. Like the Helsinki process that the Secretary General referred to, the future security architecture in the Persian Gulf should be based on the ticket principles and CBM baskets. All countries around this vital and at the same time volatile waterway should be able to enter by committing to a series of common standards enshrined in the UN Charter, such as sovereign equality, refraining from the threat or use of force, peaceful resolution of disputes, respect for territorial integrity, inviolability of borders, non-intervention in the domestic affairs of states, and respect for self-determination within states. We also recognize that we need confidence-building measures in the Persian Gulf, from joint military visits to pre-notification of military exercises, and from transparency measures in armaments and procurements of arms to reducing military expenditures, all of which could eventually lead, and I hope that's not in a too distant future, to a regional non-aggression pact. We can begin with easier to implement issues, such as tourism, joint investments, or even joint task forces on issues ranging from nuclear safety in the Persian Gulf, where a lot of nuclear reactors are being built, to pollution, where all of us are suffering from issues such as dust storms, to disaster management. Distinguished friends, at a time when we are dangerously close to escalating conflict that will affect our children and grandchildren, I encourage my counterparts in the Persian Gulf region to join Iran in making this proposal a reality. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, we have time for a few questions. And uh, can, do we have, uh, have we collected some questions already? If, the, if there are questions, please write them on a piece of paper because we are running out of time so quickly um, and uh, have them brought over to me. While we, um, we collect uh, questions, um, let me quote to you something the Emir of Qatar said when he spoke here on Friday, and I quote from his speech, all nations in the Middle East, small or large, need to agree on a baseline of coexistence. We can mirror the efforts of the European Union, unquote. What needs to happen in order to uh, get from here to there? I think I'm, I'm a bit more modest than, than His Highness. I focus on the Persian Gulf. Uh, and I think Persian Gulf, as I've said before here, is important enough because we have seen uh, many wars in the past four decades and probably the scene of the greatest uh, number of casualties in our region has been the Persian Gulf from Iran-Iraq war to Iraq-Kuwait and other, other problems. I believe a willingness to resolve issues than an interest in creating issues or keeping the impression that we have problems. Some have found their interests best served by uh, creating this impression. And you will see, you have seen that in the morning, you will see that again uh, uh, in, in the speech after me, that there is an interest in showing that there is a disaster happening in the region, that Iran is uh, devouring the entire region, which is not the case. 
We don't believe in that. We don't believe that is in our interest. We don't believe that is in, we don't believe that's possible. Let's be realistic. I mean, it's not out of the goodness of anybody. It's just the possibilities. It's not feasible. Hegemony is no longer feasible. So we need to start talking instead of creating the impression that there is a crisis. We believe there is no crisis between Iran and Saudi Arabia, provided that Saudi Arabia is prepared, is prepared to engage in serious dialogue. But if they have, if their interests are, if they observe their interests to be better served by simply projecting an image of a rivalry and a disastrous competition in which they're losing, then that's a different situation. Uh, as you know, uh, earlier this morning, we had the Prime Minister of Israel speaking here. And this question, which comes from Roderich Kieserwetter, who is a member of the German Bundestag, um, references the um, Netanyahu speech. I quote, what must happen for Iran to accept the right of existence of Israel? Question mark. Well, you see, the entire speech was trying to evade the issue. What has happened in the past several days has been that the so-called invincibility has been crum has crumbled. Israel uses aggression as a, as a policy against its neighbors. Mass reprisals against its neighbors, daily incursions into Syria, Lebanon, and other Arab countries daily bombardments, almost routine bombardments of Syria. And once somebody has, the Syrians have the guts to, uh, to down one of its planes, it's as if a disaster has happened. Disaster is aggression. Disaster is the policy of violating the most basic rights of the Palestinians. Don't look for excuses. The, I'm focusing on our region because I believe Iran's interests are best protected in the Persian Gulf region. People should not look for excuses because of their inherent inability to resolve the problems and blame it on others. They can blame it forever on Iran, but that won't resolve their problems. It's the problem of aggression, it's the problem of occupation, it's the problem of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about domestic corruption and all of that, I mean, that's another problem, but, 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 but it's a problem it's, it's a problem of trying to escape responsibility for the criminal policies that they followed for many years and trying to find a scapegoat for, for that, and sometimes people give them that as scapegoat. Here is a, uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, the um, state visit uh, to India. Uh, here's a question from Ambika, who is an Indian participant, given, I quote, given that the era of hegemony is long past, as you said, do you see the growing relationship with India after this historic visit as a counter to China's growing hegemonic ways? Well, uh, we believe that our <coughs> bilateral relations with India or for, for that matter with any country is not against any other country. We seek to preserve our own interest and the interest of in India. We seek to promote our interest and the interest of India and we believe we have commonality of interest in fighting terrorism and extremism, in uh, having access to new markets for India, in establishing uh, railroad connections, in establishing port connections, the port of Chabahar in Iran which is of interest to India. So I do not want to read uh, the intentions and motives. What we are uh, focusing on is to advance the interest of Iran, advance the interest of India in this visit, which are uh, not from our perspective uh, against the interest of any other country. Uh, I see uh, Volker Pertes, who is the CEO of a German, important German think tank, Volker. Foreign Minister, good to see you again uh, here in, in Munich. I, I very much liked your step-by-step -step approach to building a regional security regime, and um, you actually outlined that it could follow some of the approaches uh, we had in Greater Europe with the Helsinki process. Now, 
I would urge you to be a little bit less modest and imagine whether that regional security regime leading to a non-aggression pact could not include all states in the Middle East, not just those of the Persian Gulf. Well, as I said, I'm focusing on, on something that is achievable, on issues that we are a party to. We are a party, or at least are claimed to be a party, in the debate that is taking place in the Persian Gulf. Some countries in the region are, as you will hear in a few minutes, you don't need to be a lot patient. You will hear in a, in a few minutes, if we see a repeat of last year, uh, all sorts of accusations that are being leveled against us. And all these accusations are creating an obsession among some of our neighbors in the region that have led to great chaos in our region. And I believe it's important for us to focus primarily on those. As I responded in the answer to the previous question, you need to find the answer to the issue that you're raising, the crisis of Palestine, in the behavior that is happening there, in the aggressions, in the occupation, in the violations of the basic rights of the Palestinian people. That's where the answer lies. The answer is not in Iran. OK, here comes my last question. This is a tough one. Um, Haven't the other ones been tough? Oh, that was easy. Uh, <laughs> Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I hope I quote him correctly from memory an, an hour and a half ago, said uh, that if the United States were to walk away from the JCPOA, he said, I bet Israel, uh, Iran will do nothing. Well, I think this is the type of delusional uh, thinking that has gone into uh, doing everything possible to prevent the JCPOA, and then since its adoption, doing everything possible to prevent its implementation, and now doing everything possible to destroy it without having any alternative. I can assure you that if Iran's interests are not secured, Iran will respond, will respond seriously, and I believe it would be a response that we, people will be sorry for taking the erroneous actions they did. We will not be the first ones to violate an agreement for which all of us tried, in spite of Netanyahu's attempts, to achieve. We achieved it in spite of him, we implemented in spite of him, and the world will maintain that agreement in spite of his delusional attempts. Mr. Foreign Minister, uh, I know we could go on, uh, but our time has already uh, run out. I want to just say that, uh, and this should not go unnoticed, that I am aware that you only arrived a couple of hours ago after a long, long flight and what, what probably was a, a really busy visit uh, to India. So we appreciate your willingness to fly overnight, be here uh, this morning to share with our participants the Iranian view of what should happen in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you.